Welcome to Talk Commerce, where we explore how merchants, agencies, and developers experience commerce and the ecosystems and communities they work in. This week, we interview Sonal Puri, CEO of WebScale. We discuss the meaning of modern commerce, how online retailers should be thinking about new technology, the shiny new thing is sometimes the best, and how core web vitals is something that requires every merchant's attention yesterday. We also discussed Jay Smith's edgy open letter, as well as how WebScale prides itself on always pushing the market in terms of features and capabilities. Sonal also shares how important she feels it is that we mentor our young people today, helping them complete their education and finish college. The Talk Commerce podcast is sponsored by Swift Daughter. E-commerce developers solve problems daily. In fact, some of those seem like mountainous hurdles that must be climbed in a matter of hours. Stress levels can go through the roof. No wonder the plague of burnout affects developers too. Ah, but there's a vaccine for that. Investing time in your career will take you farther than you ever imagined. Meet Swift Daughter. Swift Daughter exists to help you become the e-commerce hero that is indispensable and irreplaceable at your company. We do this through Magento certification study materials and Joseph Maxwell's most recent book, The Art of E-Commerce Debugging. Go to swiftotter.com to learn more about how you can quickly climb the ranks in your quest to be a better developer. While you're there, use the coupon code TALKCOMMERCE for 15% off any digital goods at swiftotter.com. TalkCommerce is brought to you by eWay Corp. Cloud is a new normal for companies of any size. Buying, maintaining, upgrading, and disposing of machines is expensive and complicated. Amazon Web Services, managed by eWay Corp, offers an easy-to-use, flexible, cost-effective solution to all your infrastructure needs. eWay Corp can provide a secure, reliable, scalable, high-performance network that will make your office hum. Not literally. Eway Corp has saved its customers an average of 31% on their IT costs while adding 62% to the bottom line efficiency. To top that, their customers have seen 43% fewer security incidents. Go to eWayCorp.com to learn how you can start saving money and headaches by moving to the cloud. That's E-W-A-Y-C-O-R-P.com. My name is Brent Peterson and I'm your host. Please remember to subscribe wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Talk Commerce. Welcome to Talk Commerce. Today I have Sonal from WebScale. Sonal, would you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do and and what are some of your passions? Thanks, Brent. Uh, Really appreciate you inviting us to the event. And my name is Sonal. I'm the CEO at WebScale. Um, I'm sure most or all of your listeners have heard about us in some way, shape or form. Um, so I guess in terms of, you know, passion, so it's kind of hard to have passion when you're a Silicon Valley CEO, you pretty much are hundred percent. Your only passion is not allowed to be anything else besides your day job. Um, but I'm passionate about, you know, spending time with my family and my kids, my husband, my doggy. That's pretty much all I do. I work and spend time with my family. That's great. Um, well, I think one thing you could do is is you could go up in a rocket with somebody that, uh, you know, other entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley build rockets and they send up people off into space. Yes, <laughs> maybe we, we don't up- love those. We don't love those entrepreneurs because, you know, they make our lives as retailers or, or retail supporting merchants pretty difficult. So we're, we're going to let them go up and maybe stay up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, web scale, uh, you know, I've been following some of the things that you've been doing. Uh, you've been talking a lot about modern commerce, and I'm interested in hearing about modern commerce and the definition that you have around that. Maybe Definitely. Can... So, oh, for sure, for sure. So, you know, we've seen a lot change and a lot of what you see come out of web scale is what we learn from our customers. Um, there is no playbook on how to be a merchant in 2021. I don't think there was one for 2020. I don't think there's one for 2021 and, and beyond. Um, and our learning, our roadmap, what we build comes from what we see happening in the market and, and the pain points associated with it. Now, modern commerce is, you know, the way that a consumer buys is, is changing completely. 
And along with that, a lot of the, the service providers in the industry, so if you look at Google and what they're trying to do with Core Bear Vitals, their um, decision-making has changed pretty consistently as well across the years. And every time they're doing a new release, we think it's gonna be more of the same. Um, and it impacts a subset of retailers pretty extensively to the point that, you know, I've worked with at least two merchants whose whose entire search got wiped out when things like that happen. So we just wanna to get to a world where customers can make faster decisions. They can be more agile in their front end, their back end, getting away from the monolithic applications that they've been stuck with, um, starting to have a sort of more flexibility, the ability to deploy things like say social commerce or um, you know different ways of doing things on the front end, integrating um, features and functionality like machine learning to make decisions for their customers or give their customers the ability to make decisions on their sites and how they buy, um, improving the buyer's journey. And there's a lot of technology that goes on behind the scenes that, that even we are learning about as we go. Uh, but our, our role in this industry has been to be the infrastructure partner for these customers and make sure that infrastructure is never the bottleneck to do what they want to do. So if it's, you know, scale huge during Black Friday. We want to give them the ability to do that. If they want to deploy, deploy sort of new features and functionality, we want to get, to get the ability to do that. If Google is making changes, we want to make sure that all the pieces that they need to be successful with those changes and get into that, you know, call it the 90s in performance on desktop and mobile is critical for them. We want them to have the tools that we bring to the table to do that. So whether it is just looking at information, looking at logs, or, or actually things like our Cloud Edge CDN that we'll be announcing shortly, or Cloud Edge Headless, which we'll also be announcing shortly. Um, that's what our role is, and that's what we believe is, is modern commerce. It's just the tool set to be successful without having to be a technologist. Sure, so you're helping, you're enabling merchants to do their jobs better by doing sort of that hard backend work and, 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 and making their lives better through some of these technologies. Can you allow, I mean, so, but, you know, certainly head, headless is a buzzword right now. Yeah. How are you helping people through this journey of going headless versus not going monolith? And then some of the, how does the security fit into that? Yeah. Yeah, so look, I don't want to get too much into the technology weeds in this session, and we can certainly do that. Um, but what we're doing is the components that help them create sort of this headless experience. Firstly, is to share with them what we see other merchants doing. So to your point, it is a buzzword, right? People are like, um, you know, there are a lot of agencies obviously out there that want to build headless sites because they're more, um, it's a larger bill, it's a more interesting bill from their point of view. They want to showcase their abilities. In parallel, we have customers that are, are making some really good decisions, some really poor decisions, trying to rush towards a headless front end before Black Friday this year. So what we're trying to do is to share with them across the board that in our customer base, which is very large at this point, and, and we did you know, more than double last year, it gives us tremendous insight into what merchants are doing across the board. So we are able to share with these customers of the kinds of customers that are looking at you know, doing headless this year, the kinds of customers or the scale of customers that are considering headless in 2022 and how they're getting started on it and what are the tools that they're looking at. Um, and then at the, at the sort of, you know, the simplest way is making sure that our infrastructure is not a bottleneck to enable headless. So if it's a customer wanting to do, you know, a headless front end that is separated from a fully hosted shopping cart, um, we're able to do that. We don't have those restrictions that some of the fully hosted platforms have where you cannot deploy a, a headless front end in front of a fully hosted shopping cart. We eliminate those kinds of roadblocks. Um, so if you're hosted with us, great. We integrate, you know, sort of either PWA delivery or, or a headless front end, either through our proxies, if it's simple enough, or with, you know, with infrastructure that's provided to the customer. Um, in addition to that, what we're also doing is we have a concept of our control plane and our data plane. So WebScale is a software defined platform and we are really a SaaS company. If you step back and think about it, we use the cloud as a way to deliver that SaaS service to these, these merchants and give them the best of performance and availability and security. And, and what that sort of lends really well to is we're at the front end to, to add on a lot of those pieces of functionality into our data plane. 
Now our data plane so far has sat at the origin or near the origin in most cases. So you've got your control plane, which is centralized across geographies and makes decisions like you should scale out or you should you know, block this traffic or you should do X, Y, and Z. Um, and this is all so software that's built on you know, machine learning. Um, but then when you start to think about it, there's this whole concept of the edge or getting really close to the end user because user experience is what's defining the future. Right? Um, consumers are making those decisions on the fly. So taking a portion of our data plane and actually pushing it close to the end user and then inserting a lot of functionality between our origin data plane and our edge data plane is really where a lot of the development of the R&D is, is happening with web scale. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I, I look at headless as being, <laughs> as people thinking about it being more complicated than it is. And yeah. you gave your example of having a fully hosted backend. So if you take big commerce, for example, big commerce now allows you to put a headless front end on top of their back end. You're never going to deploy the back end, but you're always going to have to deploy the front end. So if you think about, say, Adobe Commerce or Magento open source in the same way, uh, you could theoretically leave your Adobe op or your Magento open source back end there without ever redeploying it while always deploying your front end. Uh, and if you think about it in those terms, it doesn't sound as complicated as it, as it does uh, just deploying one thing compared to having to deploy two things. You don't always have to deploy both things. And I think one other, one other interesting aspect about this whole headless idea in terms of security is when you do separate out the two entities, you you lose that risk of the um, of the security vulnerability in a monolith. So when your when your theme is it's directly attached to your back end, there is a there is a way that somebody could theoretically get through other than through an API point. So maybe you could kind of help us yeah. understand some of the security in that and how you're helping in a, in a security standpoint. Definitely. So let's step back and talk about web scale security for a second. Um, we deploy our security in multiple models. So let's talk about the traditional customer. The traditional customer hosts 100% with web scale um, and we secure them both front end and back end. So we are a web application firewall. We could be a bot manager. So we block all you know uninteresting traffic to, from their site, all bots, all automated pricing scrapers and so on and so forth. Um, we add a lot of features and functionality in terms of the security layer where we secure their backend as well and make sure that nobody's making changes into admin, no one's logging into admin. We can rate limit you know, a lot of the, of the things that, that occur, you know, DDoS protection or, or advanced features like so. Um, so that is sort of our traditional model of any, and, and I'd say about 50 or 60% of our customers fall into this category where they're fully hosted with web scale we're securing their front end, we're securing their back end. If there was a headless component to it, we would deploy a headless front end in front of their, their application within the purview of our full managed hosting. And we would secure that as well in the exact same way that we secured their, their back end infrastructure and their website with the WAF and secure their APIs and so on and so forth. Um, recently, I'd say in the last 18 months or so, we're starting to see a lot of customers come through the doors where they're acquiring um, a fully hosted platform. So they're acquiring a, a license with say Magento Cloud. And Magento Cloud has some included features for security, but let's just say that they're lacking in, in making an enterprise grade merchant really feel like they have all the features and functionality to secure their, their site. So what ends up happening in those situations is there's a third party security vendor. So it might be a Fastly, might be a Cloudflare, might be an Akamai, that comes into the mix and is now making standalone decisions in addition to the Magento Cloud hosting decisions. So you've got two merchants making the, sorry, two vendors making decisions on behalf of the merchant on who owns security. So now all of a sudden you've got, you know, two parties responsible for who's got the front end, who's got the back end, so on and so forth. And, and between them, they do a great job, but it is broken up, right? Um, and it is additional cost and so on. So we're starting to see a lot of customers that might be hosted in the Magento Cloud, and, and we do have real customer stories that, that do that, um, or might be in SAP Commerce Cloud, or, um, or might be in Shopify, 
where web scale is that call it that enterprise grade security that can secure their site and it's called web scale cloud edge security that that we bring to the table we've also got standalone services like if you just want bot management we've got a very effective very cost effective and functionally effective bot manager that's truly focused on on e-commerce you know we've got address lists that we've defined based on our platform where we've seen thousands of stores so we've defined address lists whether it's a you know it's Bing bots or it's Google bots and, and how these should behave on the site. We really understand that. So that's sort of my, you know, getting into web scale security. So now when you start to think about headless, in all of our deployment models, whether we are just the front end for headless or just the front end for cloud ed security, or we are the fully hosted platform, it gives that merchant, you know, tremendous peace of mind to say, no matter, you know, which part of a decision I'm making, whether I'm making a fully hosted decision with web scale or, or the front end only, they've got my back on the security. They'll secure the APIs, they'll secure, you know, the infrastructure associated with my headless front end. And you're right, the whole point of headless is I now don't need to muck around with that complex back end that I, you know, that I deployed in, in 2020. And I really hate touching it because every time I touch it, something bad happens. So, you know, really long answer to your question, but we love the way that we're able to do both, right? We're able to, you don't want to host with us, that's fine. We can still secure you. You want to host with us, that's great. We can actually give you 360 degree security and make sure that your traditional attacks from the back end on, on Magento. We still have a bunch of Magento One merchants that, that as you know, we provide M1 support and we provide, you know, we help them get through PCI compliance and we do a lot of those things as well as they sort of make their decisions on this journey. So again, Apologize for going on for so long. I just wanted to make it, you know, crystal clear on the options with with us. Yeah, and I think too helping uh, helping uh, merchants understand that um, nowadays being fully hosted doesn't necessarily mean that your entire application has to be hosted. Good example is FedEx, UPS. All those services are SaaS based services that you don't want to host and you're never going to host. So if you, if, if you as a merchant start accepting and thinking of some of these peripheral services being hosted somewhere else, and if you really want to control your experience, the one thing that you should and could be hosting would be your front end. Mm -hmm. So in terms of PWA or just straight headless uh, using something like Drupal or WordPress, and then attaching to some backend, whether it be Big Commerce or Adobe Commerce or whatever those things are, that gives you still full control over all of those. And if you're talking about a SaaS backend or a PaaS backend, that gives you that sort of second secondary good good feeling about having some of those other processes managed by. But in, in terms of like, say, big commerce, that, that's what they do. Their back end is their system. And they're going to make sure that it's up and running for the thousands and thousands of people that are using it. But the flexibility that WebScale would offer would be that ability to manipulate change and really control that front end experience for the end user. Yeah. And I think that's something that we can always do to help educate and, and sort of reduce the complexity or at least a thought of complexity on any of these uh, for any merchant. Yes. Um, yeah. I know so you're spot on, um, Brent. In fact, you know, still 70 to 80% of our customers are fully hosted with us and they love the, you know, the one throat to choke. So there's no finger pointing on where the issues are. Um, but there's a, a you know, a good selection of new customers that we're getting with that that sort of experience of back end being whatever and front end being web scale. Uh, one thing you mentioned earlier was about continuous deployments and best practices around that. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so as we start to work with larger and larger merchants or, or B2B companies or e-learning environments or you know international brands that have multiple geography um, requirements, um, we start to realize that when you track your, your own support tickets as an organization, we find that most breakage happens during the time that they're making um, code deployments or code releases. So that was becoming a pain point, both for us and the companies that we were supporting. And the second piece of it that was becoming a pain point is their 
certain e-commerce platforms that require significant downtime every time we roll our code. So on one hand, you know, merchants are asking their developers to be agile and, and make changes. You know, there's a new vision in the market that's really increasing conversions. I would like to deploy it on my site. However, I don't want a one hour, one, one hour downtime, you know, during peak sales season while I deploy that vision and, and so on and so forth. So we started to bring all these, these pain points together with our own understanding of CIC. And obviously we've been, you know, as a, as a software as a service company, we've been integrated with CI/CD using Docker to do zero downtime deployments within our own infrastructure forever. So, you know, as you notice, we, when you're hosting thousands of stores, WebScale doesn't go down every time we roll out new versions of, of software. And we roll out new versions of software on a pretty daily basis. We're making changes. Our, when you log into our portal, you'll find new interesting things, you know, on a weekly basis. I get surprised very often on Monday mornings and I find something new come up. Um, and we wanted to make that easier for the merchant. So, you know, obviously um, solving those problems as, as I was sharing with you is, is the way that we build what we build. We don't build based on our own vision. We build on what's needed in the market. Um, so we have a very sort of seamless automated CI CD process where you can do your code builds, you can do your deployments. We've actually rolled out application testing uh, most recently where you can integrate functional testing, and we've always done load testing before Black Friday for, for our merchants, but functional testing where each time you deploy, you want to be able to check everything before you deploy, make sure you know, it's all clean, getting all 200s, and, and you're not getting any error codes before that deployment. Because if you start to get codes before deployment, um, you know what needs to be fixed. So that level of visibility into, into the the site itself and say, okay, these are the URLs that are seeing the errors, go back in and fix those versus live on the site, customer service issue, someone's not able to check out. You can build all these session models. That is, you know, the beauty of sort of build, test, deploy. Those best practices getting pushed into the entire merchant universe, that's been our goal. And, and we're, we're making our way through our customer base and making sure every single one of our merchants, no matter how small, um, are in that, that, that sort of mindset of uh, build, test, deploy. Otherwise, it breaks, and we all get a lot of pain. Right. Um, so you you mentioned a little bit about how merchants expect zero downtime. What are some of the statistics or or metrics or core vital things that that merchants are looking for from you as a hosting partner, or in in general from their website. What what are some of those uh, vitals that they would be looking for? So in sort of, in terms of core web vitals itself, right? They all everybody wants to get a ninety or above in performance, whether it's desktop or mobile. Um, desktop is is more straightforward to provide because you know the the sort of screen sizes that people are looking at, the image sizes, the the link sizes, everything is more conducive to to providing those metrics. The mobile experience is an area where we have to work closely with our developer partners to, to make sure that, you know, whether it's an image optimization experience or, or it's other changes or JavaScript changes or what they do to the back end of the site can really get them to that 90. And that's our goal is, you know, everyone of our, our customers get there. In terms of our own, um, how we provide support to customers. So our SLA is 100% uptime. The web scale network has had knock on wood. I don't want to jinx myself, but the net web scale network has had 100% uptime since the last you know seven years of, of its existence and the last five years that I've been here. Um, and it's because we have certain practices where we deploy um, in a in a very measured way. It doesn't mean that we we don't make any changes. We do, um, but in parallel, our our SLA by customer for their sites or their infrastructure. Um, is a 15 minute response time. And, you know, the more I spend time in front of customers, the more I have conversations with them, what they want is transparency, right? What they want is the site is down, make sure you, you tell me that my site is down before I tell you that my site is down. Once that happens, um, give me insight into what the problem is. I get it that things break. I get it that there's a problem. I am very upset as a merchant that my site is down. But what they dislike even more is just either silence or complacence or you know, feeling that your vendor doesn't care um, or doesn't care fast enough. So, so those are the kind of things that we, we aim towards. Our, 
our response time average across all our customers for critical tickets is less than six minutes. Um, we do have a global support team that, that has to get in front of these merchants and make sure that they know when there is a problem and why there is a problem. And you know, the rest of it is we built some tools within the portal that um, give them insight into every session, every request, every transaction that happens on their website. So they can pinpoint within a second on exactly what happened and who experienced it. And you know, four years ago it would be, okay, our customer call and say, hey, I have this customer IP address, blah, blah, blah. That's not able to check out. And we'd be like, okay, well, have them try this or have them try that to replicate the issue and share it with us. Now, as we open up the portal, we go into log viewer, we look at the exact session they're talking about, the exact IP and you know exactly why they couldn't check out. So it's, you know, building those tools to help our merchants get insight and just, you know, showing up for them. I think showing up is, I mean, I, I say this to my kids, showing up is most of it. And, and if you don't show up, you're never going to win. Yeah, a, a couple of comments. Um... I, I dislike it when anybody says to you, well, it works for me. <laughs> you bring your car to the dealer and it's it's barely working on one cylinder and they, they call you up and said, it works great for me. Yeah, well, no, it doesn't, it clearly it doesn't. You, you've just given a great, a great illustration on how it's really important to empathize with your with the merchant, with your client to understand what they're going through. Yeah. Uh, and then the other point, I think the other good point you made about uh, about metrics is, uh, for example, if they're down, um, one thing that we do or have started doing more is measuring speed of the site over time. And if if uh, if suddenly the speed drops, we ask why did it drop? And oftentimes, what a merchant will do is they'll load a huge image file for say a sale or whatever they're doing. And they don't understand that that really impacts the speed of their homepage. And then, and then maybe they'll leave it there or they'll load a carousel full of files and slowly it de degrades over time. And we'll, we'll mention that to them and they'll say, well, why didn't you tell us this earlier? Or why didn't you tell us when it happened? And unless you're doing that, unless you're consistently monitoring it, um, it is, um, may, you know, maybe it's not on us to monitor what the client does, but it certainly gives them a good feeling and a better sense of partnership with the, with the merchant and the vendor when you are being proactive about those things. And I commend, I certainly commend uh, WebScale on helping and being proactive um, on all those aspects in terms of the statistics around hosting and the uptime of a store. Um, can you just go in a little bit about some of the other sort of things that you would track to help clients um, be up and, and is, there, is there leading indicators that would tell them, tell you maybe that, hey, maybe the store isn't very healthy? Yeah, so it's interesting you ask that question then because I, I'd say, and I don't have the exact number, but I believe 90% of the tickets that our ticketing system looks at are system generated tickets. And they could be anything from, you know, 60% request reject on this store or running out of storage on this store or running out of CPU on this other store. Um, because this other store had tremendous growth overnight because somebody posted a, you know, a link to a coupon that drove a bunch of traffic that they could not have predicted. So obviously predictive auto scaling is, is what we started off as a company with and, and it is still the only predictive auto scaling in the industry that actually can predict changes in site behavior and respond to it and scale out in minutes. Um, but beyond that, we built this tremendous monitoring system, which is active and passive monitoring that monitors almost every aspect of the site. Um, and 90% of our tickets, like I mentioned, are system generated and we try to resolve them either automatically or manually before they become a site down time issue. So, you know, in, in the olden days, I don't want to say olden days, but in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I was already in the industry, um, the conversations we would have with hosting companies is, when our site is down, how quickly will you get somebody on site in the data center to look at it, right? And in the meantime, you're thinking, 
if we get somebody there in two hours to fix our site, that means we're going to plan for four hours of downtime if something bad happens. In today's world, at least the way that we're sort of redefining the paradigm there is, you should never have downtime because we're going to keep seeing all those leading indicators to your point and make sure that we read the tea leaves before they become you know, a mess um, on behalf of our customers. We do that very successfully. So the tickets that actually get open tend to be more often than not human error. So it's a code deployment ticket or it's, um, you know, we didn't have certain monitors set up on a steering environment, that steering environment had an issue or, or things like that. Um, and those are the 10% of tickets that really take human intervention to get fixed. And those are situations where bad things have already happened. Um, and every week we, and this is probably more insight into our business than you care to listen to, but every week we have a critical tickets meeting which you know, Jay attends and I attend as well, Jay's our founder and CTO. Um, and we look for patterns. And every time we find a pattern, we talk about, let's automate this, let's put in a monitor for this. And, and now we've got a very large scale monitoring dashboard that, that our support team is starting to, to look at, which is just seeing trends over customers. Because remember, we're a service provider. And the difference you know, with, call it, traditional managed hosting with the likes of Rackspace, they, they were one customer at a time. The difference with WebScale is we are sort of this, you know, this sort of broad service provider that looks at all customers. No, I, I don't, but our system looks at all these customers and triangulates information. And it's like a learning engine across thousands of stores. So it, the more time we spend doing this, the better our engine gets, the better our automation and, and detection technology gets. And um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, right? We just need to get bigger and bigger. And, and the more we work with merchants, the better we become as a platform. Yeah, that's good. So you mentioned Jay. Um, I, I did read a recent uh, open letter that he posted about your lineup being edgy. Can you yeah. kind of dive into that? I that's uh, it's a little bit subjective. What does edgy mean? Yes. Oh, for sure. I mean, we do have some customers that are really edgy, but that's a, a different part of the conversation. So here's what was going on, right? Um, all through the pandemic, um, our merchants, especially the the you know, the B2B and the B2C, and, and especially certain verticals, saw just absolutely tremendous growth. Um, and we were finding that some of them had infrastructure that needed to be just better. Um, there were features and functionality that we needed to counter things like you know, enabling headless or enabling you know, better core web vitals or, or getting our CD and our advanced CD and deployed in front of customers. And we were working our way through all our customers you know, one conversation at a time. Um, so whether it's our ASE or whether it's Jay or whether it's me, it was one session, one meeting at a time. And we were having a corridor conversation and, and we would talk about these, these experiences that, hey, we met with customer X and you know, we turned on X, Y, and Z of these new features that they didn't know we had and we hadn't talked to them about and we got it there. So Jay came back and said, you know what, I think I'm just going to write an open letter to our existing customer base just to share with them what we've got. And the ones that have the pain, they'll bubble to the top because you start to do that right as you get bigger as a company. And when he did that, we decided to just publish it on the internet because it's important for every merchant to see what the options are. So let me talk about, you know, there's obviously what we do for, for CDN and things like that, but um, the edgy portion of it is we we launched, and, and we actually launched in early 2020, our first cloud ed service, which is cloud ed security, which sits in front of, call it a Magento store, a Magento uh, commerce cloud store, or an SAP commerce store, or a Shopify store. And so that is cloud ed security, and it's pretty much um, a set of features that gets really close to the end user and controls the experience, whether it's performance or availability or security or you know, advanced features and APIs like headless, all the way from the edge right next to the floor to the end user, all the way back to the origin to the back. And once you can secure that, you can really influence it. You can insert services on the fly. You can sort of you know, enable features and functionality that you couldn't earlier because if you enable things at the origin, and they deploy the third-party CDN, what happened from there to the edge changes the customer's experience completely. And so in this case, you know, we we were 
focused on our origin business, but we realized that very simply using cloud resources, if we push our own software to the edge, which we've done, um, it completely changes the game for these customers. So pushing security to the edge was one of the first things we did. Um, pushing CDN functionality and, and our web controls to the edge is what we're doing. Pushing headless to the edge is what we're rolling out in July. So our, our sort of product set is getting enhanced and, and pushing out from just the origin, which you know, we, we believe we're the leaders in e-commerce hosting at the origin using cloud resources and now really enabling those sort of head services is critical in the big day. So that was what that open letter was about. It was it was sort of getting everybody on the same page in the fastest way we know how. Um, and it's a complicated piece of writing. In fact, I, you know, it's not um, it's not a, a a piece of information that got very broad coverage because I think for most people it was a lot to digest. You know, James got a lot of um, He's doing a lot of enhancements on our platform and as we speak. Um, so yeah, it was it was an interesting write-up, which you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have an engineering degree. It took me a while to digest everything that we put out there in front of our merchants. So now I think we're gonna break it up into simpler pieces on the how-tos and get them in front of our customer base, as well as the broader users. Yeah, I think a good illustration of how clients could look at extreme edge. Um, we, we built a POS system using Magento or Adobe Commerce, and they hosted the POSs in-house. So essentially, it's a headless application, but every single retail store had their own environment hosted locally. So it was running a, a somewhat of a PWA locally, while still connecting always with this backend that's centrally, uh, that's central. Uh, and that's the extreme edge where you're you're actually hosting it on your own local machine. But the edge that you're talking about would be the closest thing that the client could get in their own network uh, in the cloud. And that would gives them the, the uh, fastest load times they could get um, in their local, in, the, in their, in not their local, but on their, in their city or in their country. And I think that's where really where the PWAs now uh, are really going to shine and give maximum performance for all of our clients out there. Absolutely, and security. You know, it's, it's funny how many merchants I talk to that are actually willing to walk away from consumers that are not secure. They don't want to serve on unsecure browsers anymore. They don't want to serve on you know, old versions of, of platforms anymore. They're all about keeping their, their brand and their security at the highest level. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Adobe and how you haven't been afraid to point out some <laughs> things that maybe they're not doing so well, or even Magento when 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 they were Magento. Uh, how just talk a little bit how you communicate with everybody and and how you know I think that you help push some of the things that need to be improved in terms of uh, of hosting and infrastructure and client in awareness and service. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you approach that. You know, so the way that we went about it, it was more sharing the frustration of customers that we spoke to. And you know, I, I consider myself to be somebody who's extremely fair and I actually, will say that I'm Adobe's best friend in getting their platform to improve. Because if if people like me were not speaking up in the industry and not you know telling the world how bad it was, it would not have gotten better. And what Adobe never realized, or, or maybe they do, is that they and WebScale are on the same side. Uh, we are on the side of keeping the Magento brand alive. We just want it to be done right for our customers. So from our point of view, whether they host a WebScape or they host a Magento Cloud, it's fine. We can still provide that services and we do very successfully. Um, and I think we're better sort of aligned than we are as on opposite sides of the fence is, is the way it appears right now. Um, but yeah, that was the, the two open letters that we wrote to the Magento community. And, and it was just the level of frustration that we heard from you know, a number of our customers. Now, I understand that Adobe has gotten a lot better. Um, I still think there's tremendous amount of confusion. I think, you know, what they did to M1 end of life and how suddenly they did it. And, and 
I, I guess it wasn't as sudden, but if you if you think on behalf of the merchant and you realize the pain that these merchants go through and how it's almost impossible for them to cough up four hundred thousand dollars to let's just replatform, right? Because which is gonna end up like with your, your product. Um, it shows that it's a big company, a big public company making a decision, not thinking like a little guy merchant and, and really sort of considering their problems as they do. <clears throat> so they lost out, we lost a number of customers who re-platformed off the jet completely and went to a Shopify or a you know, pick your flavor of like the thousand e-commerce platforms that are floating around the planet. Some of them really bad decisions. I don't think those are good decisions for the merchants, but they made them in desperation. Um, because you know, Magento also got I think, PayPal to send out emails to all these merchants saying, you know, we're gonna we're gonna stop merchant processing on your site if you don't move off M1 M1 end of life and, and get to M2, which was just like those are just nasty things to do to people who are struggling to survive in, in commerce anyway. So it was, you know, I don't want to make it sound like we're all, you know, we are running a business. This is not a nonprofit, but we're also, I think, giving individual merchants a voice that that they don't have as individuals. When a company like WebScale you know, says, bring it and puts it out there, uh, I think it helps everyone. And it helped, I think it helped Adobe tremendously. So they're welcome um, that, you know, that we were able to help. And, and I do wish that they keep improving because Magento is a pretty solid platform. I was just talking to somebody two days ago and they said, there is still no other option out there that gives you that level of functionality and customizability that Adobe does. Um, but they're their own biggest enemies. They do dumb stuff as a sales team, they do dumb stuff as a development plan. I don't know. I, I have my own frustrations with them, but I'm not afraid to speak up as, as you know. <laughs> yeah, the, the big thing I, I remember on, on the migration or having to migrate from M1 to M2 and having security that get, went away would was that if you wrote that software custom, you would have to get it, it would have to pass PCI, PayPal and Magento, whoever would never look at you twice as long as you're passing PCI. Yeah. But because you're on M1, and even though you're still passing PCI, now they're trying to scare you into moving. And certainly we've we had some clients that moved I would say a little bit too quickly. They didn't take some of the time they should have taken to go through all the steps to go to M2, maybe rushed through some of those projects uh, when they did, it was, it was unnecessary. As long as you're passing PCI, there's no reason that you need to go to M2. And especially if your underlying software like MySQL and, and PHP, if all those are, are now meeting that requirement, that's even less of a reason why you need to, why you need to go uh, to Magento 2. Not that we don't want people to go to Magento 2, but I agree that that scare, tact, that, that scare tactic didn't work well for Adobe at all. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree, Brent. That was really sad. What? What they did, and, and especially PayPal sending out those messages, I felt was was not a responsible thing to do because it was not reality. It was a scared actor thing, and it, it scared merchants and it hurt them. And I, I think they went elsewhere. So we all lost those customers. They didn't stay you know, where they were. Yeah, I think the most recent thing that's now binding the community back together and some complacency that that's happened say over the last five years is just the, the, the speed of Magento. We all got thinking, oh, well, Magento 2, four seconds is an okay time. And suddenly uh, uh, Willem Wigman, Wigman came out with this new theme that loads in less than a second. And that's on Magento 2. And it's amazing how now, number one, the community's kind of rallied together to get this. Um, and we have some fast Magento 2 sites uh, and where traditionally, I mean, good or and the, the wrong thing people would tend to do would be point to hosting providers to say, well, how come you can't host my site any faster? Yeah. Um, when a lot of, you know, a lot of the slow sites were on Magento Commerce cloud. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not the, it's not the, um, it's not the back end code, so you can't blame Magento, the code itself, but you can blame how those themes are built 
and the fact that nobody decided to do anything about the theme for five years. Yeah. Um, and it went into complete complacency. So there's, there's a lot of things that I think are getting better in our, in the Magento community now uh, and improving. Um, Absolutely. It's, I, I'm starting to see a lot of the bigger enterprises make, you know, recommit to staying on Magento for longer periods. And, and we went through a scary period early, you know, I would say late last year, where a lot of merchants, especially the smaller ones, were like, no, we're just replatforming off Magento. And it was like, it was a bloodbath for us. You know, we lost a lot of customers. We still doubled overall as a company in terms of revenue, but I won't say that did not hurt. That hurt. Yeah, so we have a we have about ten minutes left, or less than ten minutes now. What what if we kind of move on and you help us to understand what you're listening to now? Maybe a book you're reading. What's in, what's interesting you right now? So, like I shared with you, right? I spend a lot of time with my kids and my family, at least over the weekend, because this job is is as full time as it gets. Like you're never off. Um, you know, the phone is is there all the time and it's, it's all consuming. So I don't want to tell you that I read very inspirational books. I actually read complete and total fiction because I just need to empty my mind. Um, for the most part, when I'm in the middle of this, so I'll reach like, I'll read like Lee Child, like Jack Reacher books, or I'll read, you know, other kinds of fiction that I really enjoy. Um, but I try to not read sort of, you know, work-related books when I am reading that's the only way that I can calm down um, and think about the broader world. I've been doing a lot of, you know, walks with my husband on the beach. That's been really helping during the pandemic. We, we started doing that because you couldn't really, I mean, you could walk around the block, but after a while it gets really boring. So you just drive to the beach and walk up and down. And that's, we're so blessed where we live that, you know, it's 30 minutes away. And so that's sort of what I've been doing as well. Um, reading the waves, I guess. So yeah, that's been my, that's what keeps me sane. And then just goofing around with my kids. <laughs> uh, and what about if you had something that you could tell a merchant, like as a little nugget, what could you give them right now? So right now I'd say there's so much change in commerce and there's so much coming their way. There's so much opportunity, right? We've seen, so, um, so retail was 14% or, or commerce was, e-commerce was 14% of total retail before the pandemic. During the pandemic, we went to as much as 40% of all retail was e-commerce, which is, you know, we've been waiting for that to happen and we figured it would happen over the next 10 years, but it happened in a year um, in the worst situation possible. So all of us saw tremendous benefits from that. I don't think it's ever going back to zero. In fact, I was just talking to another customer of ours this morning um, who wanted to get my insight. And I said, I think we stay in the 20s uh, and we start to grow from there, but these are consumer habits that you know, have been changed forever. So there's so much to be thankful for as merchants. It's a difficult industry. Um, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's easy. I don't think any of the companies we work with have it really easy or just have excess capital or do not have competition. There's none of that, but the opportunity is so tremendous. You can reach so many more consumers um, technology is an enabler for, you know, it's been an enabler for all industries. I think it's, it's an enabler. Um, you know, we see AI builds companies for manufacturing. We see machine learning for automotive. We see so many different things that are really playing a role in, in pushing customers forward. I would say, you know, don't hesitate in embracing some of these newer ideas that, that we bring to the table. Don't hesitate in investing in your infrastructure. Um, Obviously, be careful and you know, work with trusted partners, but jumping towards the next shiny thing um, sometimes may not be a bad idea in today's day and age. But there's a lot of, I mean, I get surprised you know, most mornings when I talk to, you know, to Jay or, or to one of our merchants, I'm surprised with how much has changed, uh, how quickly. It hasn't changed in the last five years, it's changed in the last five, six months. It's just a lot of opportunity. Yeah, one one thing I'll mention that that you had talked about earlier is that people need to look at their mobile scores, their mobile lighthouse scores specifically, because it really differs from, differs from their desktop score. 
And now Google is going to start penalizing. Well, they've been penalizing you if your mobile site's slow already, but that's going to only get accelerated. And more and more are using mobile first. And, and especially in the mer merging markets, uh, a lot of people don't even have a desktop computer. I know that we're active in the Bolivian market. Yeah. And in Bolivia, very few people have desktops. Everybody's using their mobile phone, which is the same in Africa, which is very similar in India uh, and, and a lot of the other markets where there, you, you need to look at your mobile and you need to look at those scores. And I would implore you to reach out to your partner, your, your agency, whoever, even WebScale to help you understand what those scores are. And that'll, they, right in that, if you use Google Lighthouse, in that they tell you things that you can improve on. Yes. No, it's, it's exactly right, right? I mean, I've been learning so much about Lighthouse. I've been learning about Lighthouse over field data versus immediate data in your Chrome browser, you know, using developer tools and so on. There's just so many tools out there that, that you can use to understand. And interestingly enough, a lot of our merchants, when we talk to them, they don't, they, have, they don't realize how much has become mobile over the last few years because people are not sitting in an office. Like I'm sitting in front of the desktop right now, but they don't realize that that changed over the last one year where you know, a lot of people were probably sitting on their couch on their phones, making purchases, not on their, you know, their work machines or whatever they're doing in the past. So the world changed, you're right. About half of a lot of our merchants traffic is mobile, if not higher than that. It depends on fashion beauty retail is, is much higher than that, sometimes it's 80%. But, um, there's a lot of work to be done there with your developer partners. You really need to rethink your site strategy um, when you're thinking about mobile scores. Desktop, slightly easier to solve. You can throw you know, CDNs at it, you can throw some tools at it. Magento is a slightly different you know, monster when it comes to, to impacting that score. You need to do a little bit more than just throw you know, acceleration tools and making the site faster. There's work. Yeah, Not I think some. Game. Sometimes you look at 2020 as we forget about it, but yeah. in terms of your, in terms of e-commerce, I think you brought up a great point. The e-commerce grew 15 times while we forgot about the whole year together. Everything else. <laughs> yes. yes, yeah, we you know WebScale as a as a tech company became really cool because of the pandemic, because of what we were able to to enable for our merchants. Yeah, Don't that's great. Be, it was a terrible year in most ways, but in this way, it turned out to be positive for all of us. Uh, well, I, I really appreciate you coming on today and 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 talking about a lot of this. Uh, it, at the very end, I always like to give people a chance to give a shameless plug about anything you'd like. So, what what what's your shameless plug today? So let's see. This you know, obviously, this session has been. I've talked about web scale a lot because that's probably the technology stack that I'm closest to. Um, there's a lot of you know realizations that one has over a year, like the pandemic, you know, working with the kids, working with the um, you know, first generation kids going to college. So my son applied to college this year um, and got in. I worked with six other kids who were first generation college goers to try and help them through the college process and. By far in my life, that was the most rewarding thing that, that I have ever done. And you know, if there's a shameless plug, I would say if each one of us with college degrees can help one or two kids just find their way through, you know, getting into college, even if it's new in college, like just furthering their education, getting beyond high school. Um, I think it really makes a difference to, to everything. I mean, it's the only way to solve a lot of critical problems that you see around you get an education. I know there's, you know, big shots in the value say, you don't need a college degree. I respectfully disagree. I think it teaches you discipline and function and depth of knowledge that that is in a learning environment. Um, it's very difficult to get those developments. So, you know, that's the one request that I have for everybody is, is do that and spend lots of time with the kids. Yeah, I know that my son, when he was probably 13, said, well, Bill Gates never graduated from college. Why should I go to college? <laughs> you should believe so, the outliers. <laughs> yeah, you know there why. are definitely always outliers in there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's great. I, I really appreciate that. That's a, that's a very good plug. And, and Sonal, again, thank you for being here today. And I really appreciate your time and your insight. And it's always interesting talking to you. Likewise, Greg. Thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you. Bye.
The Talk Commerce podcast is sponsored by Swift Daughter. E-commerce developers solve problems daily. In fact, some of those seem like mountainous hurdles that must be climbed in a matter of hours. Stress levels can go through the roof. No wonder the plague of burnout affects developers too. Ah, but there's a vaccine for that. Investing time in your career will take you farther than you ever imagined. Meet Swift Daughter. Swift Daughter exists to help you become the e-commerce hero that is indispensable and irreplaceable at your company. We do this through Magento Certification Study Materials and Joseph Maxwell's most recent book, The Art of E-Commerce Debugging. Go to swiftotter.com to learn more about how you can quickly climb the ranks in your quest to be a better developer. While you're there, use the coupon code TALKCOMMERCE for 15% off any digital goods at swiftotter.com. TalkCommerce is brought to you by eWay Corp. Cloud is the new normal for companies of any size. Buying, maintaining, upgrading, and disposing of machines is expensive and complicated. Amazon Web Services, managed by eWay Corp, offers an easy-to-use, flexible, cost-effective solution to all your infrastructure needs. eWay Corp can provide a secure, reliable, scalable, high-performance network that will make your office hum, not literally. eWay Corp has saved its customers an average of 31% on their IT costs while adding 62% to the bottom line efficiency. To top that, their customers have seen 43% fewer security incidents. Go to eWayCorp.com to learn how you can start saving money and headaches by moving to the cloud. That's E-W-A-Y-C-O-R-P dot com. Thank you again for listening. My name is Brent Peterson, and it has been my pleasure to be your host today. Please rate and subscribe to Talk Commerce, new shows out every week.